Today's guest posed a challenge. Several months ago, she called and said, how about using the idea of working with an easy to sew pattern with the goal of seeing how many creative designs we can make? I love a challenge. So the stage was set for my sewing duel. Amy Berkman was the person who gave the call, and she's a challenger, and I'm pleased to have her return for the second program of this series to share our sewing results. Welcome back, Amy. Thanks, Nancy. Well, it's easy to change the look of the pattern when you have a simple palette to start with. If you have a fabric that looks attractive, as attractive on the right side as it does on the other right side, consider eliminating the facings and bringing the traditional wrong side forward. The sewing steps are extremely easy when you know the sewing tips. One easy pattern, six terrific looks. That's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira. Specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios. Fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover. Makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. Amazing Designs and Class A Needles. There are numerous fabrics that can be used for this jacket as long as they're heavy enough. And for our single layer sensation jacket, we chose a suede fabric, suede like fabric, knitted fabric that has fleece on the back side. So just one layer of fabric. You may find, Amy, an upholstery fabric that is pliable enough that looks attractive on both sides that could also be used. A tapestry type of fabric mm -hmm. works really well. And as Amy shows you the jacket that we created, it's just one layer. It's just one layer, and you can see how the suede exterior and then the fleece interior are showcased. Um, what we've done is just taken the wrong side of the, and the, is the accent detail when the fleece seam allowance is sewn, to, stitched to the outside of the mm -hmm. garment. And I'll swing it around here too and show you the, the back of the garment. Again, another detail. Um, where the interior is switched to be the exterior. Mm -hmm. And again, it's simple to make because it's just one layer that you're working with. We've chosen a pattern that is very simple in styling. If you've joined us during the first series, you saw the basic pattern pieces. You're cutting out the front, the back, the sleeves, and one collar and one belt, not two. Exactly, you just need one thickness, so we'll be working that way. So the facings, normally you'll have a back neck facing, a front facing, you don't even have to worry about those. So here in our sample, we'll show you some of the construction tips that help, and the first one would be attaching the collar to the jacket. You'd sew with the traditional 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance, and then after stitching, I'd like you to trim the collar. Now this is messy fabric. It is, <laughs> it, it pills, and you'll definitely want to have a, a lint roller to keep yourself clean during the process. When you finish your coat or jacket, put it in the dryer for a couple minutes. That's and a great then idea. you'll get rid of all the extra little fleece. Then pin the seam allowance forward and edge stitch from the top. And I'll just put a pin here, and Amy, you can show on the finished coat the stitching, so it holds that seam into place. Yes, this is exactly how you'll finish it, and it just gives it a nice clean look when you take out that extra mm -hmm. bulk layer. We fold the interior to the exterior, and if you do this with thick fabric, you're going to have a lot of fabric right at this corner. It's going to be difficult to manage, and since this doesn't ravel after it's kind of been lint, put, delinted through the dryer, um, I'm going to show you how to miter the corner. Five eighths of an inch seam allowances so you can mark them, especially at the corner. You can mark the entire length, Amy. I think this is a good that idea. Would, that would be the safe way to Sure, you just keep mark it. And then you'll be you it. folding the fabric forward and doing some pinning, but I want to show you right at this corner. That's the most important. We'll angle, draw a 45 degree angle and snip. And if you have our pins ready. I do. Okay, great. Then we'll just fold on the fold line 
And after folding, you fold it the way you'd like it to look, basically, and then stitch. And here's a close-up of edge stitching from the right side, sewing in this area. And after you've done the stitching, that's all there's to it. Now this fabric doesn't ravel, but if you had a fabric that did ravel, we have cut a collar out of the upholstery fabric and surged the edges. I love that, that definition that that surging brings to the fabric. And because it is going to ravel, we would fold in a miter rather than trimming and then do the top stitching. And what a nice contrast for a single sensational jacket. Look number five of One Easy Pattern's six terrific looks showcases the facing. Destined in the past to be tucked quietly to the inside of the jacket, the facing now takes center stage. Flipping the facing to the outside with a surged edge adds pleasing vertical lines without the work. Flip and surged facings are an innovative designer approach. We're working with denim fabric. It has a little stretch to it and it looks nice on the inside as well as, as the outside and it's a fun jacket. This is one of my mm -hmm. favorites in the series. Here you can see from the collar where we've actually taken the the mandarin collar and it becomes more of a lapel collar and that showcases that wrong side mm -hmm. that really is a nice accent with the surging. And there you can see the facing as it creates that princess seam and that sure. vertical line that we all love. And here you see the fun surged buttons that are wrapped and created. And I'll spin the jacket around. And then again here you can see where that we use the buttons again to attach the little um, band that highlights our fun inverted pleat accent. And then the facing, the back facing is again exposed so it gives a nice detail. It totally does. changes it without the look without the work, I should say. The crescent roll buttons. Love the buttons. And here's what, where we start. We start with a, here we have a, a two by six piece that then we find the center and then slice it, surge the center, and here I'll show you how we're gonna roll this up, just as we mentioned, crescent style. Mm -hmm. Just like the roll. And we did fuse two layers together to make the buttons a little heavier, so if you, you could do right. that if you wanted to. Here's mm -hmm. the example. Mm -hmm. And then we made a small version too. And that was a one by three to make the buttons for the back. So you roll it up like a crescent roll, do a little hand stitching, and then you can stitch it to your garment. For the construction for the surged edges, here we have a sample of the front and back, and the collar is sewn differently. The collar is sewn the right side of the collar to the inside of the jacket, and the neckline is sewn. Looks a little unusual right now. The facing and collar are sewn together in the traditional manner with right sides together, so we have the facing. The outer edge has been surged, and I'll give you some surging details and tips in just a few minutes, but that outer edge, or I guess more the inner edge, has been surged now. You can press the seam allowance of one piece upward, the seam allowance of the another downward after doing some grading, and then pin the neckline. And Amy, this takes just a little time to pin all around to make sure that these are aligned. You want to make sure they're aligned when you start surging. And then the outer edges can be pinned. So you pin the facing all the way around the neckline, the front, and then machine base. This is a really important step. Using a contrasting thread at the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance, machine based the layers together. And that is the preparation for the next step. Now Nancy will show us how to actually serve, serge those edges. For those of you who are serger owners, this is an excellent way of finishing the outer edges. We'll be trimming off the entire seam allowances. Just as a review for a setup, you have many options. I chose to use all-purpose sewing machine thread, not serger thread. Sewing machine thread is a little heavier. It's three-ply. Serger thread is two-ply. I'm going to have more of a trim-like effect because I'm having slightly heavier thread, and this color matched my fabric perfectly. Left needle, right needle, upper looper, lower looper, all threaded in a very traditional stitch. We did surging the outer edges of the facing, or the, I guess it would be more like the inner edges, the 
the curved princess style seams, we use the same stitch on a single layer. But now, you saw this sample earlier where the edges of the collar, the edges of the front, were machine basted together along the 5 eighths of an inch stitching line. Now you're going to do a test. You always need to test when embroidering, when surging, anything decorative, and I've already done that, getting the correct length and the correct width. But I know I don't want that seam allowance because I'm going to trim it off. So having the guideline, that basting line, is a perfect place to guide the blade. So I'm just slowly, take a little time. You don't have, this is not a, a race. You can trim and then the machine will create a trim-like edge. It's trimming off the fabric and creating a decorative edge. And then I'll serge off the fabric. And I'll show you this serger tail right here. And you can see it looks neat on both the inside and the outside. Then we'll turn corners by just raising the presser foot and doing some more serging. You'd serge both front edges, the hemline, the hemline of the sleeves. Take it easy and serge at a consistent pace. We're getting there. It's rather therapeutic, actually. And after serging all the outer edges, we need to do some securing of the thread tails. Now the thread tails at the corner can be secured in a, a several different manners or ways. Sometimes I place a drop of the, a seam sealant, uh, seam sealant on a cotton swab, place it in this area and let it dry, and then with a darning needle, tuck the extra thread tail on the underside. And that's exactly what we did on the finished jacket. Then for the facing, the facing that is now on top instead of on the inside, you pin it to your jacket and with a straight stitch, top stitch all the way down around the front, along the neckline to hold it into place. Let's take a look at the finished jacket. It gives that princess style look because we have the seam, but it's really not a seam. It's just that facing edge that's attached down into place and it gives an attractive different look. Some different stylized lines with a lot without a lot of effect. So you can search and you can flip the facing and you have another great designer look. Tone on tone detail, it's one of my favorite touches. Subtle color variations give a very elegant look. Combine the understated thread color choice with sophisticated embroidery and the streamlined jacket takes on a totally different look. We have linen, linen, gray, elegant, and embroidery. Beautiful embroidery. I love the filigree design that we've added to the mandarin collar. And we've done it in an, in an asymmetrical style. Here you can see where we've done, used our test embroidery pieces to actually create the covered buttons. This fabric just drapes beautifully, so the style of the jacket really creates a wonderful piece. And then here you can see that with the back pleat is now actually not inverted, but on the exterior. We then took the belt tab that was, or the tab that was up here and decided to use it more as a back belt and just tacked it in place. And again, we have the beautiful, beautiful filigree design showcased there as well. So Amy, we have the collar that we're going to do the placement of the embroidery. So for those of you with computerized embroidery, you're going to print out the images of the embroideries you'd like to work with, and we have four of them that we're going to place on the collar. And notice the stabilizer. It's long, much longer than the collar, and we'll have a continuous embroidery tip for you. I have a stabilizer that's a press-on, iron-on stabilizer, and it's a tear-away, so later on we'll be able to tear it away. Thankfully, my iron sole plate is about the size iron. of the... Perfect fit of the collar, so I'll just tack that down and it'll stay. And now let's do some positioning. This is fun to just design yourself the final look. I've, with chalk, may have pressed off, but I would mark the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance so this would not fall into, the designs would not fall into the seam allowance. And pin this on, and we're not going to be concerned about making it symmetrical. And I'm kind of an asymmetrical mm. kind of person, so I appreciate that. 
So here this we go. This design allows for uh -huh. such a nice flexibility mm. in the placement. Okay, we got to get that to fit. There, I think we're good. Okay. I think we're fine. We so you do some positioning, take a little time in, in doing that. And then it's time to do the hooping. Whatever, if you have a large embroidery hoop, please use it. The, the larger, the better. Placing the largest of the hoops underneath the stabilizer and getting that first embroidery in place. Now I may, for later on, we'll sneak that back in here, but I'll sink the smaller hoop inside the larger one. And truth be told, it's easier to do this on a flat surface than it okay. is on an angled table. Looks like it works. And Nancy, now let's look and have you show us how to do the filigree embroidery. For those of you who have a computerized embroidery machine, you know there are several different ways that you can approach hooping the fabric. And when I hoop the fabric at the table, you notice that I really didn't pay special attention to getting the grid of the printout of the design aligned in the hoop. You know, usually there'll be the grids that will be printed right on the paper, and you would like usually these grids to go from side to side and be horizontal and vertically placed within the hoop. If you have the technology on your machine that you can scan and have a camera, I'm just going to show you this. One option would be to get this collar hooped exactly square. And what I'm going to show you is just placing a positioning sticker that came with my machine over the center cross mark of the embroidery design. And you'll find that as I put it into my hoop, that design is totally askew. Well, what I can do is on the screen that I have, I can position or I can depress the icon that for the camera and that my machine now is going to scan where I think about that sticker is and I think it's about in this quadrant so I'll tell it to scan and there it will go. This is just one option. There are many other ways that you can get your design positioning but it scans until it finds that positioning sticker and you can see there it's it's landing straight on. So now it's going to tell me to remove the, the, the template. But before we do, let's take a look at that design. It's now been canted in the same angle as the template is right on our fabric. So you can see they're parallel, which is really quite clever. Have to remove this. Now, I used masking tape to position the template after I had pinned it into place. Now, I simply have to lower the presser foot. I have the machine set up for embroidery with decorative thread in the upper thread, and I have a lightweight bobbin thread. This filigree design is very delicate. It's quite large, and it takes about 17 minutes to stitch. So we'll just let it stitch for a while, but I'm showing you that this is the design that's in one half or one quarter of the collar. And we'll just let the machine do its job. The design is finishing up, as I mentioned, it took about 17 minutes to stitch. And previously I removed the template because it would have been kind of in the way of the stitching at the next design. So I'd reposition this and you can see it's not going to fit within the hoop. I'd run out of space so you'd snap the hoop. You'd advance it to the next area so you'd advance it and I'm normally you would take this out of the machine and reposition the hoop. And let me just show you on the next sample that I have. This design has been stitched. I'm ready to stitch the third design, have it kind of tacked in there with the masking tape. I'd get it positioned once again, stitch this design, then advance it. You can see that's why I used the longer stabilizer so that I could easily take care of this. So after you've embroidered your design, you simply then press your fabric and create your collar, and it's an elegant filigree design. Today's Nancy's Corner guest has a remarkable mission. It's to bring joy, healing, and community through textile arts. In memory of a friend who lost her life to domestic violence, and as a pledge to help others, Sue Rock founded a nonprofit organization, Sue Rock Originals, to repair and revitalize lives. 
Sue joins us today via Skype. Sue, how are you doing today? Fantastic, really. Thank you so much for having me, Nancy. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've had the opportunity of speaking with you earlier, and you are coming to us from Queens. Oh, actually, it's Brooklyn. Sorry. Brooklyn. I'm sorry, excuse Brooklyn, me. New York. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn, and you have a remarkable story to tell that happened oh, seven years ago, that started seven years ago. So give us a little history of how Sue Rock Originals came to be. It's, a, it's an amazing story of two experiences coming together and creating a good cause. Um, seven years ago, in New York, indie fashion was very in. And it was at the same time that the garment industry and the interior design industries were slowly coming to, you know, they were slowing down a great deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, we decided, well, since a lot of this fabric was being released onto the market through sure. the Internet, why not try to resource it and create a business for ourselves? Something small, something interesting. Well, the first time that we went for a fabric pickup, Nancy, it was 15, 50 gallon bags of fabric. <laughs> well, it was more than we could even imagine. And uh, we thought with all of the fabric that was available, we could utilize it, but maybe we could transform the remainder into a craft charity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, at the same time that all of that was going on and we were continuing to make pickups, a dear friend of mine passed away, and unbeknownst to me, it was due to a domestic violence incident. Now, this is a woman who was living in a suburban area mm -hmm. here in New York. Mm -hmm. She had kind of a wonderful civil service job, two children. You know, her husband had the same, and that really didn't matter because she was still going through the trials sure. and tribulations of domestic violence. So, looking at how to do a craft charity, having this experience resonate, you know, mm -hmm, for myself right. and for my husband, because we knew the woman, it made sense to try to create something that would apply itself to people who left. Sure. What happens when a person leaves? And so we created something that was very unique. It's domestic violence support with a textile twist. Textile support winds up meaning uh, creating a way for people to have all of the self-sufficiency skills mm -hmm. and all of the self-sufficiency materials that your grandparents had, my grandparents sure. had. You know, it's an intercultural sure. experience. Um, but right now, using the resources that are being discarded from these industries each and every day. And us being here in New York, these resources are abundant sure. and they're constant. So behind you, we can see that you're you're situated right in your storefront or in your yeah. shop, and there are p places for people to come and learn, to experience textiles, and then also to purchase, correct? It's marvelous, yes. And women, you also work with women, you teach them to sew right there, who have been experienced. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's a two-part process. When we sure. first started, it was with knitting and crocheting. I think like seven or eight years ago, the wave of knitting and crocheting sure. was riding through the country. And so many people were getting back into it. And so we started with that, pushing the envelope, encouraging people to not just do hats and scarves, but let's see if you can do a shrug. Sure. Let's see if you can do a skirt. Let's see if you can make practical items that a woman would need once she leaves this very difficult situation and wants to start this new life. Uh, that's the first part of our work. We do donations. And so we'll have people come, donate items that they have handcrafted. Mm -hmm. What you see behind me are two mannequins wearing skirts that were made by volunteers to help support survivors of the Haitian earthquake. That's another way that we have volunteers make items sure. with donated materials to contribute to people in need. But the other piece is that because we have so much and so many different types of materials here, we're able to train. So what we have is a domestic violence empowerment program sure. in which if a woman is living away, either in a residence or with mm -hmm. her friends, she can come during the time that she's kind of in between right. and make all the things that she would need by the time that she leaves that temporary housing situation. I mean, these are, these are tough times all around. Sure. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. many folks don't have the skill base that we used to have. We've taken on the responsibility to actually teach that skill base mm -hmm. and enjoy watching the creative process sure. heal. 
Sue, so it's a remarkable story. It's inspiring how textiles have brought together. The, it touched so many lives and unified. Been, been a real inspiration. You have worn my heart, and I know others will enjoy reading about your story even further. You can go to all things of Sewing with Nancy are found at nancyzeman.com, and you can click on the N Nancy's Corner section and find out more about Sue Rock Originals. And Sue, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And thanks to you for watching our Sewing with Nancy series. Join us next time. Bye for now. Nancy has written a fully illustrated book entitled One Easy Pattern, Six Terrific Looks that includes the Indigo Junction Chinois pattern plus all the information from this two-part series. It's $19.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com 2523. Order item number BK2523. One Easy Pattern, Six Terrific Looks. Credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at nancyzeman.com to see additional episodes, Nancy's blog, and more. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.